Attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, my name is Brittany Kapinski and I want to welcome everyone. It is now 1 p.m. so we will begin our presentation shortly. Today on Friday, July 20th, we will have our presentation on town centers, their conditions to success, economic opportunity, and what they say about preferences toward inviting walkable places, given by Matt Butley. For help during today's webcast, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call 1-800-263-6317. For content questions, please feel free to type those in the questions box and we will be able to answer those at the end of the presentation during the question and answer session. Here's a list of the sponsoring chapters, divisions, and universities. I would like to thank all of the participating chapters, divisions, and universities for making these webcasts possible, as well as the Economic Development Division for sponsoring today's webcast. As you can see, we have um, a number of webcasts planned for the next few months. To register for these upcoming webcasts, please visit www.utah-apa.org slash webcasts and register for your webcast of choice. And we are also offering some distance education webcasts to help you get your ethics or law credits. These webcasts are available to view at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast archive. And to log your distance education CM credits, you can follow the instructions at the top of the web page. You can now follow us on Twitter at Planning Webcast or like us on Facebook Planning Webcast Series to receive up-to-date information on the Planning Webcast Series sponsored by chapters, divisions, and universities. And to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to www.planning.org slash CM and select today's date, which is Friday, July 20th, and then select today's webcast, which is Town Centers, Their Conditions to Success, Economic Opportunity, and What They Say About Preferences Toward Inviting Walkable Places. This webcast is available for one and a half CM credits. We are also recording today's webcast and it will be available along with a PDF of the presentation at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast archive. And at this time, I would like to introduce our moderator for today, Dustin Akers, who will introduce our speaker for today, Matt Wetley. Hello, my name is Dustin Akers with the American Planning Association's Economic Development Division. We encourage you to visit our website. Um, you can either uh, be directed through the link on your screen or by visiting the, the American Planning Association's homepage. Click on About APA and then click the Divisions tab in Economic Development. We also have a blog at apaeconomicdevelopment.blogspot.com. You can follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at APA underscore EDD. You can also like our Facebook page and we also have a LinkedIn group. Today's speaker is Matt Wetley. He is an AICP certified associate with development strategies in St. Louis, Missouri. Matt has over 10 years of experience in market and economic analysis, planning, and urban design. He passionately seeks ways in which best practices in public space, placemaking, POD, mixed-use development, and public-private partnerships can be leveraged and utilized to create lasting and meaningful developments that are economically viable. He emphasizes site analysis as a means of conceptualizing and discovering development opportunities and has led development strategies in devising methodologies to identify and quantify demand from targeted consumer groups for residential, office, and retail projects. Matt has advised on numerous projects throughout the U.S., particularly in the Midwest, including urban infill and new town center projects, as well as downtown, neighborhood, district, and waterfront plans. He has presented on town centers at conferences and serves as a guest lecturer for graduate and undergraduate courses. I will now hand it over to Matt Whitley. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that introduction, Dustin. Um, I just want to thank the Economic Development Division for, uh, for bringing me on board here. I'm so, uh, I'm so excited, so enthused to talk about uh, something I'm, I'm very passionate about to a broad range of planners uh, from all over the country. Um, I will uh, keep my uh, presentation under an hour and uh, hopefully leave plenty of time for uh, questions and comments for you all. So uh, to start off, I just I want to say my name is Matt Wetley and I hate shopping. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. But I love retail. I love retail um, because I love public space and I love places in which people uh, gather and interact. And you can take uh, some of the best uh, design public spaces. 
uh, great sense of enclosure, uh, broad sidewalks, great street trees, all of these different elements. And if you have vacant storefronts, you don't have a place in which uh, people generally want to be or feel comfortable in or want to interact. So uh, that led me at a very uh, early time to uh, start studying retail and, and the things that make them successful. And uh, I've had the, the good fortune over the last 10 or so years to work on a number of town center projects uh, in, various, uh, in various ways and uh, learn what makes some of them successful and uh, why, why other ones are you know, marginally successful and why other ones fail. So I want to share with you uh, some of the knowledge that I've, I've learned because, um, uh, because it has uh, broad applicability, I think, for, for uh, a number of planners. Um, but first, I want to share with you a couple of, uh, a couple of quick anecdotes uh, about town centers. Uh, one involves a, a very good friend of mine uh, who lives in Columbus, Ohio, uh, which is where I lived for a while. And uh, he was a coworker of mine. We worked together in the early 2000s. And he actually lived in downtown Columbus uh, as early as, I want to say, 1993. And we would uh, you know, we'd get together Monday morning, and he'd ask me how was your weekend, and I'd ask him how his weekend was. And he'd say something quite often like, um, well, I went for a walk downtown, and um, there was nobody there. And so I, uh, I got in my car, and uh, I drove out to Easton because I wanted to be around people. Well, Easton is Easton Town Center, um, which, is, uh, which was built on a green field in, in Columbus uh, back in the late 90s. has been hugely successful, gets something like 15 million visitors a year has really inviting uh, public space and uh, open spaces, and is always filled with people. And uh, I thought it was so interesting. Here's a planner, an urbanist, somebody who lived downtown long before downtown Columbus started to revitalize and become more active and vibrant and, and add housing units. And this is where he went to spend his, his free time. And so I thought, what could we, what could we learn from, from this town center that can help us invigorate uh, some of our other urban places? Um, I have another friend, also lives in Columbus, lives just south of downtown, and uh, he wouldn't be caught dead at uh, Easton. Um, his, his comments about town centers are that they're kind of, they're fake, they're not connected to the surrounding community, uh, they're Disney-like. And I, I can understand it and appreciate his point of view, but I think it misses the, it misses the point a little bit in that um, over the last 10 or 15 years, people have been uh, shoppers have been voting with their feet and they've been saying, you know, we, we prefer an environment that's open air, that's walkable, that's mixed in use. This is where we want to spend our time and not just to shop. This is where we want to spend our free time. And I think that has, as I'm going to, as I'll demonstrate, I think that has broad applicability for the planning profession, that there is some market justification uh, for efforts that, uh, that, that seek to uh, improve public spaces, and create uh, retail and mixed-use environments uh, that, that uh, are centered around public space. So I'll give you a quick outline of what I'm going to take you through over the next, uh, well, a little less than an hour, I suppose. First, I'll give you an introduction. I'll give you a brief history of retail in, in three slides or less. I, I know this is a pretty uh, educated planning audience, so uh, I'll, I'll make that fairly brief. Uh, I'll, I'll define town centers because there's a little confusion as to what they are and what they aren't in some instances. And I'm going to talk about three central concepts, three prisms, if you will, uh, or lenses through which I look at town centers and, and that, inform, that I think inform me and in, should inform planners uh, about some broader policy issues. I'll take you through some case studies. I'll share with you evidence of success of some town centers, ways in which public spaces have leveraged to create value. Uh, I'll talk about some of the conditions of success because uh, not all town centers are created equal and uh, some do better than others. We'll talk about some of the factors involved in that. Uh, since this is being put on by the Economic Development Division, I thought I'd talk a little bit about implementation, share with you a few public-private partnerships that have helped uh, make some town centers uh, either, either happen where they otherwise wouldn't have or made them better than they otherwise would have been. And then lastly, I'm going to share with you for the last 10 or 15 minutes some conclusions that I think we can, we can draw from some of this information and some, some, some potentially some broad uh, policy ramifications that it could have for, for the planning profession. Okay, so um, 
retail, uh, the evolution of retail over the last hundred years, and, and three slides. Uh, three slides. Um, let's let's talk just very briefly about the the sort of streetcar era. Uh, this picture is actually from downtown Detroit, uh, circa about uh, 1930. Uh, if any of you have been to Detroit recently, they are experiencing somewhat of a revitalization, but uh, it's nowhere near this active and vibrant uh, at this point. Um, although hopefully getting there. But um, here you can see you see the streetcars. You see some cars coexisting downtown, but generally you're looking at a space that's that's scaled to the pedestrian. It's human scaled. Uh, this is this is where retail was was evolving and shopping experiences were evolving. Uh, prior to uh, sort of the advent of the interstate and automobiles and so on and so forth. Uh, and then the, the next phase, which you all are familiar with as planners, the mall era. Uh, I love this image because this is a postcard from, from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, the idea that somebody would have bought this postcard and sent it to a family member and they weren't trying to be ironic. They were saying, hey, this is, look at this, this is the new development in our community. Um, and they were proud of it. Uh, this was uh, this this uh, shop. Uh, this shopping typology was was very popular. Dominated a good portion of the last half century. And then, starting in uh, I'd say the early to mid '90s, uh, the pendulum started sh uh, shifting back to to what I would call the placemaking era. So this is an image of Phillips Place in Charlotte. Uh, this was de developed in the early 90s and has been very successful. And uh, it accommodates the automobile, but um, it uh, is developed to more of a human scale and is, is uh, developed to accommodate the pedestrian. Uh, parking is kind of hidden in the back and in, in parking garages. Um, this became uh, sort of a model that's been replicated many times now. And by the way, that model uh, was uh, based on a sort of forgotten model, if you will, which is Country Club Plaza, uh, which uh, uh, began being developed uh, in the 1920s, then didn't do so well during the 30s during the Depression era, uh, but is now again thriving and is the finest example of a town center anywhere in the United States. The architecture, uh, um, the, the quality of the street environment would be very difficult to uh, to completely replicate today, but nevertheless, developers have taken numerous cues from this this particular development, which is the most successful uh, retail center in the Kansas City area. So now I'm going to define town centers, and I promise you, uh, this is the only time during the presentation that I'm going to read a couple sentences from a slide. Um, but it's really important. I want to define uh, to you all what the town center is is not. So as the ULI defines it, a town center is a walkable, open-air, multi-use development organized around a clearly identifiable public realm. It's anchored by retail, dining, and leisure uses, as well as residential uses. At least one other type of development is included, office, hospitality, et cetera. So okay, it starts with public space. It definitely has to have retail, and also ideally some residential uses, and ideally one other, one other use, right? A little simpler definition that I'll share with you all. Um, this here is a, a very, very well designed town center by, uh, developed by Steiner and Associates. It's called the Green in Dayton, Ohio. And this is, uh, this is a residential development here, if you can see me scroll over that. Uh, well, in, but you can see well incorporated into the broader retail development, right on public space. You've got a pretty well defined street grid, very walkable. Uh, parking's oriented in the back. It's a very nice uh, town center. Uh, this is um, this here. If it looks more like a mall with the top popped off, uh, we'll call that a lifestyle center. Or more accurately, since there are a couple of anchor stores here, uh, one might call this a, a hybrid regional shopping mall slash lifestyle center. Okay, so it's open air. And there's a little bit of effort, uh, 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 a little bit of emphasis uh, put on public space, but uh, more or less, it looks looks and feels a lot like a shopping mall. Okay, so I'm going to talk about these three central concepts with you now. The first one I want to talk to you about is market premiums. And these are, by the way, as I mentioned, these are the sort of prisms through which I look at town centers. And I feel we all look through the, the right lens. We can draw a lot of conclusions 
about the implications of the success of town centers for our profession from. So um, I'm going to take you back to like senior year in high school economics, supply and demand. Uh, because I recognize uh, talking to a group of planners, I know you all are very concerned about social equity. And I'm going to be talking about market premiums and how public space is leveraged to create higher lease rates for office and, and, and retail and higher rents for, for, for residential uses. And our, a lot of our clients are really interested in, in how public space can be used to leverage value. But I'm more interested in something else. I'm interested in what these market premiums tell us about ourselves. So supply and demand. Um, when there is a lot of something and, and very little demand, there's a lot of supply and very little demand, we generally expect prices to be pretty low, right? But then when there's a scarcity, when there's um, relatively little of something that a lot of people want, prices go up, right? Well, that's essentially what, when I see a town center and I see an office development that's achieving uh, higher lease rates than it otherwise would in a more commodity location like a, 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 um, a typical suburban office park, when more value is being leveraged because it's adjacent to a walkable town center with, with public space, that tells me that there's a shortage of something, that, that the market, people are telling us, we want, hey, we want more of this. So that's really, that's really interesting if you think about it. That has some implications for planning. And I want to talk to you about the European approach to retail versus the American approach, which are two very different approaches. This uh, picture is one that I took. Uh, this is in central Amsterdam. This is their, their main shopping district. And um, Amsterdam, as a lot of you, a lot of planners are probably not surprised, they have sort of centralized regional control. Okay? So where I live in St. Louis, we have something like 200 municipalities, uh, all buying for retail and so on and so forth. Here you've got one region, one centralized body saying, okay, you can develop retail here, you can't there, and so on and so forth. And um, they do a number of things to really help benefit this central uh, shopping district. Uh, like, for example, other shopping districts in the region uh, have restricted hours. Maybe they're not allowed to be open on Sundays. Maybe they're not allowed to be open in the evenings. Uh, they limit competition. They only allow so many areas in the region to be developed with, um, with full-blown shopping centers. They have a lot of mixed-use development throughout the, throughout the city for anybody who's been to Amsterdam. But a limited number of centralized shopping centers. Okay? And, well, what does that mean? Well, it means that the shopping centers they do have are very successful. Um, Europeans do shop a, a little less than Americans, but um, actually they, they shop, but they still shop a fair amount. Uh, they just shop at fewer places. And what that means is that um, retail sales at the shopping centers and developments that they have are much, much higher. They get, they get a lot more volume of business. And as a result, uh, the, the, the owners of the shopping centers can charge retailers a lot more rent. So, for example, uh, you can see here in St. Louis, where I live, the sort of highest lease rate at the, the most successful shopping center is about $35, maybe $40 a square foot. Uh, in Amsterdam, in their central shopping area, it's $295 a square foot. Um, and even their kind of other prime shopping centers are, are $85 a square foot. And in fact, you can see um, the central shopping districts, the sales in places like Paris and London are much, much higher. Um, so this is interesting because at $35 a square foot, if you're a private developer, um, it's pretty hard to, with, with lease rates that low, it's hard to build structured parking, it's hard to build underground parking, it's hard to put a lot of money into uh, infrastructure, public space, architecture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's why our, our, a lot of our retail shopping centers are so stripped down and, and surrounded by, by surface parking. And that's not just true of St. Louis. Uh, lease rates are similar in places like Columbus and Cincinnati and Kansas City. They're a little higher in places like Atlanta and Houston. So sometimes in those communities, uh, structured parking is possible, from a, uh, possible to finance uh, by the private sector. But in most cases, it's not in those markets either, as anyone that's been there into those uh, community snows, there's uh, a lot of surface parking uh, associated with retail. And you know, it's not just the, the Londons and Parises of, uh, of Europe that have high lease rates. Uh, you look at Stuttgart, which is a very, I think, economically comparable community to a region, to the one in which I live, St. Louis, Glasgow, Warsaw, 
Bratislava, Slovakia gets higher lease rates than uh, most, most mid-tier markets in uh, the United States, even though, like for example, St. Louis or Columbus, Kansas City, they have stronger regional economies than Bratislava, but they have a lot more, a lot more retail. And you can see just nationally, um, we have on a per capita basis continued to add more and more retail. In other words, the retail growth has far outstripped population growth in the United States. And the net effect of all of that is just it's depressed uh, achievable lease rates. And that depresses then what the private market is able to do in terms of the quality uh, of our, of our uh, shopping and mixed use environments. Uh, one last concept I want to look at, and this is something you all should be very familiar with, it's the sort of coming uh, demographic transition. Uh, we all know that uh, we're, we're getting older, there are going to be a lot more seniors uh, in our communities moving forward. There are going to be a lot fewer households with children. Okay, And when we look at preference surveys, more and more people are, are, are rating as important, uh, being able to walk to a number of amenities. Uh, people are telling us, a sizable minority are telling us they want to live in a more walkable environment. And in fact, uh, references towards housing and the types of communities that people are living in are changing. A majority of people would, would prefer to live on small lot housing or attached housing, particularly if it means they can walk to a mix of uses or employment or at least be uh, close by to those types of uses. And interestingly, uh, some studies have shown a third of all suburbanites, people that live on in conventional cul-de-sac environments, I would prefer to, to live somewhere more walkable. So keep that in mind. I'm going to come back to that concept a little bit later. Also, uh, the millennial generation, think of people born roughly after 1980, uh, basically 9 and 10 said they want to live in a more urban, walkable setting. Okay. So what we're seeing is a sea change, I think, in the types of environments that people want. And town centers have been one of the leading indicators of that. And we also know uh, that in the housing market, for example, it's becoming more segmented. Yeah, there, are, there is your market for people that want to live in conventional suburban markets or, or environments, but also we're seeing this market for walkable communities, TND communities, first ring suburbs, urban infill, and TOD projects. And the same goes for retail, okay? It's becoming more segmented. And some people would really like shopping in, a, in an urban downtown environment. Uh, other people would like shopping in a you know, quasi-urban town center environment, okay? So that market's becoming segmented as well. All right, so I want to talk to you all now about uh, some evidences of success. Uh, and um, I want to talk about Easton Town Center, which I uh, spoke about very briefly before. It's in Columbus, Ohio, and you can see this image here. This was built in, uh, first phase was built, I believe, in 99. And uh, you can see it has a pretty well-defined public space, nice sidewalks, uh, nice sense of enclosure, and uh, full retail storefronts. Um, and the, an amazing thing happened. As a market analyst, this is like a dream come true, okay? In Columbus, uh, when I was going to grad school in the late 1990s, early 2000s, three shopping malls, three new shopping malls opened more or less at the same time. And so we were able to uh, compare the performance of the three uh, in, in sort of a head-to-head -head competition to see how they did. Okay, so you had Easton Town Center, and you had these two other malls, a more conventional and close malls, the, malls at, the mall at Tuttle Crossing and Polaris Fashion Place. And you can see what they look like, very, very kind of typical and close mall. We all, we all know what that looks like. And here I want to share with you uh, the locations of, of the three of these, because this is what gets really interesting, okay? Because basically, Easton had the, the inferior location of the three, all right? So I'm going to look at, this is a map of the three. We've got Easton Town Center, Polaris Fashion Place, and the mall at Tuttle Crossing. And it superimposed these, or I should say our, our GIS expert, Yash Yadavali, superimposed these over an income density map, okay? So we're basically looking at population, uh, uh, density and income, and, and we're identifying hot spots where we have high density, high income. And so you can see these areas in red or orange, this orangish color, these are areas of high density and high income. These areas of green, yellow, these are lower, low density, low income areas, uh, particularly the green. So you can see the mall at Tuttle Crossing clearly has the superior location of the three, followed by 
Polaris Fashion Place. And when I say superior, I say retailers, they like to be uh, in areas where there's a great deal of income density, typically. Uh, and then you can see Easton in really the area with the least income density. So how did these three properties perform? We got two conventional suburban shopping malls and one town center. Well, town, Easton, in fact, despite what might be categorized as an inferior retail location, has greatly outperformed those other two properties. Uh, their sales per square foot at, five, at about 550. Uh, the mall at Tunnel Crossing with that great location is at 425, which is not bad for the Columbus market or for a mid-tier market. Uh, Polaris Fashion Place at 366, uh, not performing nearly as well as Easton. And in fact, a survey uh, showed that 7 in 10 people from Columbus preferred Easton over Polaris. And this was really significant because at that time there was some question as to whether an open-air uh, town center would uh, perform well in an area in the Midwest that gets that has winters and snow and these sorts of things, the answer was resoundingly yes. And over the next decade, we saw a, a significant amount of uh, town center development throughout the United States, throughout the Midwest, and 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 places uh, as cold air. And why not? Uh, studies showed that uh, uh, shopping centers that uh, emphasize public space and design, uh, people people stay longer and spend more. Okay, so. Um, that the public space uh, and inviting space can be leveraged to create a lot of value. And here's some data provided by Steiner Associates. They developed Easton Town Center and have developed a number of uh, town centers throughout the U.S. since. Uh, they're definitely among the best uh, such developers in the United States. What they've shown is the leisure expenditures. This, this is kind of what's different about a town center. People don't just come here to shop. They come here to have a good time. They come to these places to to drink, to have food, eat, spend, uh, and in fact, in many cases, spend their evening there. Okay, so you can see, like Saturday evening expenditures are much higher at a town center than a conventional mall, because nobody goes to like, okay, you you all, you all are familiar with like a food court concept, right? It's like a suburban shopping mall. Nobody like goes there specifically to go to the food court. You go to the shop, and then you happen to be hungry, and maybe you buy something at the food court. And in the case of town centers, a lot of people go, you know. Just, just for the, the leisure activities. And in fact, the leisure visits at town centers can, al can almost rival shopping visits. So by having public space, inviting public space, it, brings, it, serve, it works as an anchor, and it brings people in, and they come for things other than shopping. They come to stay and have a good time. Town centers also are catalysts for uh, value creation for a number of other uses. Uh, office development. I, I mentioned Country Club Plaza in Kansas City. Um, it is the best, uh, the most successful retail environment in, in Kansas City. It is also the most successful office environment. Um, the office environment has taken a hit there a little bit uh, following the recession, but nevertheless is still the top performing office environment uh, in Metro Kansas City and historically has far and away been the most successful environment. It's, it's because of the, the other amenities there that's made it so competitive as an office location. Same is true for residential development. I've got three examples here, uh, one in Pittsburgh, one in Columbus, one in Dayton, three different town centers. And uh, these are um, uh, rental properties uh, for which uh, I was able to do uh, market studies for initially before they were built. And in each case, um, the rents that are achieved uh, far exceed uh, median rents in, in, in those market areas. So you get a sense of the value premium that town centers create. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about conditions to success. So <clears throat> not all town centers are created equal. Uh, some do incredibly well. Um, some do reasonably well. A, a few that have been developed have, haven't performed uh, particularly well. And the reason is retail is incredibly complex. There are a lot of stars that have to align in order to have a successful retail environment. And uh, if you're, whether you're a developer or you're a community with a, a site that you're looking to develop as retail or a Main Street environment that you want to invigorate, there are some things that are a, a bit out of your control, like the economy. Okay? There were some really well-conceived retail town centers that opened in 2007 that didn't perform very well because the economy wasn't doing well. We don't have a whole lot of control over that. Uh, households, demographics. Retailers like to be in income-dense environments, right? 
um, if you're a developer, you have some control uh, over households and demographics because you can select a site. If you're a community, you have less control. You already, your, your demographics, they, they sort of are what they are uh, in many instances. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you, need to, um, you need to take that into consideration uh, when putting together a retail concept. Oops, I skipped ahead there a little bit. Uh, but the point I want to make is the, the area that you have most control over, whether you're a developer or whether you're a community, is marketability, okay? And um, that involves a lot of things, whether it's like basic things like safety and cleanliness, um, whether it's the tenant mix, what kind of anchors you have, inline retailers, or you know, uh, perhaps most importantly, design. Design is something, that's an area in which you can exert some measure of control. Uh, and in particular, public spaces, uh, the public spaces that uh, people will occupy and the quality and character of those, that's an area in which you have some control. And that's one area in which you can distinguish yourselves, whether you're a developer building a property or a community trying to improve your Main Street environment. That's a way in which you can distinguish yourself from, from the competition. It's the area in which you can add value. Um, and also land economics and parking and infrastructure. I'm going to talk about that a, a little bit later. <clears throat> so let me talk about a few conditions to success. Demographics, right sizing your project. Easton Town Center is a million and a half square feet of retail. There are a million people within a 20 minute drive time of that location. I've been asked to assess deals where uh, over a million and a half square feet were proposed and there are maybe 200,000 people within a, a, a 20 minute drive radius. That's not a project that we would, we rec would recommend uh, move forward. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's looking at your demographics and right sizing uh, your project to your community. Also, population growth. Is it, is it necessary for, uh, to realize town center development? Uh, no, but it, it helps, of course. But here, uh, here's a case study in Toledo, Ohio, uh, which is uh, my hometown. And um, actually, yeah, two town centers were built in, over the last five or six years in, in Toledo, which has had no population growth. Uh, but there was a competitive opportunity. The, the regional shopping malls were competitively, competitively compromised. Uh, the developers came in, built a, a more attractive product, and uh, they've succeeded, uh, perhaps to the detriment of those uh, shopping malls, uh, one of which is now being uh, considered for uh, Grayfield redevelopment. It's more of a mixed use concept. Tenant mix. Let's talk about tenant mix. Uh, this is important to anyone, whether you're developing a town center or have a main street environment. Um, <clears throat> it's all about looking at your competitive environment and, and how you can best be positioned within that. So here's a picture of Zona Rosa, uh, which was developed, oh, uh, six, seven years ago in uh, Kansas City. And as you know, Country Club Plaza is located in Kansas City. That is an extremely competitive uh, town center, and I don't think anybody could hope to compete directly with that. Uh, what this developer did was they came in and said, okay, we're going to do a town center uh, uh, pretty far away in the metropolitan area from Country Club Plaza. Country Club Plaza is south of downtown. This is far north of downtown. And we're going to position ourselves a little differently with a different tenant mix. So they have Marshalls, DSW, uh, Old Navy, some, some, some discount merchandisers. It's also a lot of overlap, by the way, between these two centers. They both have a Panera Bread and, and, and a lot of similar in-life retailers. But you can see with the tenant mix, they've, they've positioned themselves a little differently. And as, as a result, both can kind of co coexist uh, peacefully uh, because they, uh, they target different markets. And so that's, very, that's, that's a good lesson to learn uh, for any retail development. Anchors, anchors are, are absolutely essential. In most instances, uh, there are a few lifestyle centers in very high income areas that, that defy that, uh, uh, that truism in uh, town center developments. But um, you know, conventional anchors like the ones you see here, uh, also public space can be an anchor that draws people in. People come and then they spend some money in the retail uses uh, or nearby uh, retailers. Uh, and then leisure uses uh, like, uh, for example, um, a cinema can also uh, bring people in. These are still pretty essential to making retail work. So think about what your anchors are, what they can be. And uh, now I'm going to talk about uh, design. As I said, this is an area in which uh, communities, developers, developments can really distinguish themselves. 
So um, these are the details that good um, town center developers obsess over. Developing at the human scale, addressing the street, hiding parking, um, and, and looking at uh, having ample sidewalk with uh, landscaping, these sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> urban design fundamentals, okay, things we learned in planning school or urban design school, uh, or architecture. Uh, looking at creating a sense of enclosure. Again, good developers uh, of these projects obsess over these details. Height to the width ratios, making sure you have that that, that right that right feel and sense of sense of place. Um, which um, here's here's a couple of good examples. Um, Workdale Village in North Carolina, Crocker Park in uh, the Cleveland area. Uh, street width 60 to 160 feet. You can say see in each case they created a nice sense of enclosure. Uh, this project, uh, not so much. Uh, 300 feet wide, uh, single floor, uh, retail buildings. This does not have a really strong sense of place, uh, although it was built as a town center of sorts. Um, you can see that, that kind of green area in the middle with the fountain. I mean, nobody's going to walk across that street and spend time there. Uh, there isn't even a place to sit. Uh, this clearly is geared more toward the automobile. And as a result, it's not going to be able to create the sort of placemaking, generate the placemaking premiums that uh, one would see at some other town centers. Um, <clears throat> in addition, uh, this kind of this kind of draws a contrast between you know really thoughtful design and uh, making a simple making a, a, a gesture with a fountain. Okay, so um, you know here you have this sort of fountain in the middle. It probably looked good on a plan. Hey, we've got some green space, a fountain, but when you really look at the details, the sense of place, it's, it's lacking. But whereas here in Country Club Plaza, here's a fountain that's incorporated into a more human-scaled environment with more fine-grained details. And, and you know, this, this is a much more, I think, a much more appealing image that's going to draw people in. Here's another uh, instance uh, of, I guess, uh, a bad public space design. Uh, my wife pointed out this kind of this reminiscent of like a video from like the Stalin era, like some parade that in which uh, tanks might might be uh, driven down the middle or marched down the middle. Um, and interestingly, you can see these these trees that they put in have really narrow calipers, not much of a canopy. Uh, in this case, with as, as wide as this plaza is, I think they needed uh, bigger trees with bigger canopies to create some sort of sense of, of place. And uh, retailers can't wait 10 or 15 or 20 years uh, for uh, tree canopies to develop. There's a case in Ann Arbor, Michigan. This is, a, this is a, an actual Main Street environment with wide sidewalks and mature street trees. And you can see how, how much more supportive this is of, of you know, like human-scaled activities. And uh, this is their Main Street. It's very, very popular. And while we're on the subject of sidewalks, uh, you know, in order to support retail and have a pretty well-developed street side zone in which people can walk and, and yet there's room for outdoor, uh, outdoor seating, these sorts of things, and a buffer area from traffic, you really need a minimum of 12 to 16 feet. I've worked recently on a number of road diet projects where we're looking at the communities looking at reducing their number of lanes from four to three and then taking that extra space and doing something positive with it. Uh, be it parking, wider sidewalks, or bike lanes. And uh, I have a lot of uh, friends in the uh, planning field um, that are big proponents of active transportation and, and uh, developing bike facilities. And I think that's great. But I can tell you, in terms of supporting retail, if it's a zero-sum game, we've got a finite amount of space, and we can either widen our sidewalks uh, from 6 feet to 12, or we can add some bike lanes. I can tell you the sidewalks will win every time in terms of supporting a healthy retail environment. So maybe it's possible to reroute that, that, that bike, uh, bicycle facility uh, the next street over from your main street, for example. Uh, I would definitely advise on putting your investment into the sidewalks. And let's talk about, uh, let's talk about, uh, let's talk a little bit more about design and street networks and integration of uses. Here's that project I was talking about, the Green and Dayton. You can see how well integrated this retail use is to public space and retail, uh, uh, this, this residential use, rather. Uh, they've done an excellent job of integrating that. Uh, here's another good example, Southside Works in Pittsburgh. Um, 
This uh, was built uh, <clears throat> on the location of a uh, former um, uh, steel mill. And you can see there was quite a bit of infrastructure in place and, and quite a bit more put in. So there's a really authentic street grid here. And so what that does is create a great amount of act uh, connectivity between different uses. We've got residential uses here, retail, office, all connected by uh, and, and integrated by a really good street network. And here's sort of some public space. And I believe the long-term plan is to develop some public space along the waterfront as well. So they did an amazing job. Uh, by contrast, here is a, here's the, uh, a site in Denver. This was an old shopping mall. And you can see the street network they have. It's not a grid. And so uh, when this shopping mall failed, in order to redevelop this site, they had to just rip up all the existing infrastructure and put in new infrastructure uh, to allow redevelopment to occur. So, you know, doing a street grid is more expensive in the short run, but it is more supportive of, of redevelopment over time because rather than having to, to redevelop uh, 1.5 million square feet at a time, you, you can redevelop block by block as some, some portions of projects fail and while others continue to do well. And then <clears throat> here's uh, Easton Town Center, which was built on a greenfield. So uh, the infrastructure, the street grid, if you will, had to be put in place uh, entirely, uh, entirely new, uh, which is a pretty expensive proposition. But uh, interestingly, again, you see this well intact street grid. This is this is uh, this is to scale. This is what um, that Belmar project looked like uh, prior to redevelopment. You can see this is going to be more supportive of, of single use redevelopment over time as as certain pieces, uh, you know, uh, reach the end of their usable life. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about land economics and parking and infrastructure because that's the big issue, right? Like. How can we do away with this park? We, we know we have to have parking. We have to support the automobile in order to uh, support our, our retail businesses. Um, but how can we do it in a manner that it's not uh, so intrusive that we lose our, our human scale, we lose our sense of place? Uh, and a lot of that comes down to economics, economics and design. So uh, one thing is, in a lot of mid-tier markets uh, like St. Louis, um, the economics of retail are a bit more supportive of public-private partnerships that lead to uh, structured parking than is office. Um, so in St. Louis, for example, and this is true for a lot of mid-tier markets, peak rents are a bit higher than they are for office. Uh, but the business model is different in that retailers are able to push a lot of expenses like utilities and so on off to their tenants, whereas in many environments, office, uh, <clears throat> uh, office landlords are not. So your net operating income, I mean, incomes are higher for retail, expenses are lower. Your net operating income is actually much higher, uh, and this can translate into hundreds of millions of dollars of, of more development value, which means there's a little mo more money left over for developing public spaces, putting some money into garages, maybe through a public-private partnership uh, with a, a TIF strategy or something like that with the municipality, whereas office is getting more and more difficult to, uh, to uh, utilize and and and, um, and have the private market provide um, structured parking. Land economics. Uh, why do we keep building in green fields when we've got some perfectly underutilized sites in, in more sustainable areas, more transit accessible areas? Well, it costs a lot more to acquire uh, acquire developed land, even if it's marginally utilized. So, here's a project we worked on in St. Charles, uh, Missouri. And uh, they've got a um, they've got a hundred year hundred plus year uh, historic district, and here's kind of what Fifth Street looks like. Uh, here's kind of the, the character and quality. We actually did a market study and said this is this is the quality and character of development that could be supported in this environment. In other words, if you were able to build this stuff at the right price, the market would come. They would occupy these residential uses. Uh, these office buildings, these these retail storefronts. Uh, however, uh, you have to acquire this property, and it costs a lot more than it does to acquire property in greenfields. It costs about uh, a little over, in this environment, a little over a million dollars to acquire an acre of property, whereas uh, down the road, uh, greenfields are going for $300,000 uh, a square foot, or an acre, okay? So it's a lot cheaper 
uh, and so private development often goes where there's the path of least resistance. Um, and so sometimes, unless we have broad policy changes, uh, sometimes cities uh, need to get involved to help uh, effectively subsidize the cost of that, that acquisition to make development happen. Uh, residential development, uh, condos in particular, the condo market's not strong right now, but it has been in the past and will be again. Um, that's also, um, uh, condo development also enables um, development not only of parking to serve the condo property, but uh, through some strategy like, like tax increment financing, the development value uh, of those properties can be captured and can, some of that can be funneled into uh, creating structured parking that helps support retailers and office uses. And sort of lastly, location matters. Okay, so um, in terms of economics and parking, uh, this is Southside Works, and it's located pretty close to downtown, pretty close to uh, the universities in Pittsburgh, as well as some, some major medical and research institutions. And uh, people are willing to pay for parking here. And so what that does is that helps defray the cost that the uh, municipality is uh, on the hook for or, or needs to come up with in order to finance structured park parking. So in, in essence, in this case, the future value of parking fees uh, paid to help finance half of these parking structures alone. So the city only had to come up with another 50% uh, through some strategy to, to finance these or the developer only had to come up with another 50 percent. So uh, uh, a thought to leave you with on conditions to success is that there are a lot of reasons why projects succeed or fail. It's not necessarily that if, if you see a town center fail, it's not that the, the, the interpretation shouldn't be that, hey, um, apparently people don't like public space. It's just that hey, retail projects are pretty complicated and there are a lot of reasons they succeed or fail. Um, a takeaway I'd like you to have from, from this part of the presentation is that great projects are often unlikely to happen on their own, especially in mid-tier markets where we're grossly over-retailed and lease rates are so low. Uh, and redevelopment costs for a town center are generally higher because at least, at least early on because it requires more upfront expenditures on infrastructure. So I want to give you a couple of... Uh, um, a couple of brief uh, implementation case studies, uh, cases where public-private partnerships came together to make <clears throat> town centers happen. Uh, this, again, I'm going back to Southside Works in Pittsburgh. Uh, this LTV plant closed in 1990. The city acquired the property in 1993. It took a full 10 years to clean it up, get the infrastructure laid before phase one opened. But ultimately, $100 million of public money were invested in this, and it's to date leveraged $250 million in private investment. Uh, and development is continuing to occur there. And it was a pretty complicated project with uh, some public money, some tax increment financing, uh, structured parking revenues, and also some, some help from the federal government. A little less complicated of a project, Easton Town Center. Uh, for phase one, the city did uh, kick in $26 million as part of a, a TIF uh, tax increment financing project. Uh, in that case, the developer assumed all the, all the risk uh, they signed a letter of credit, and if this property didn't perform as as uh, as projected, well, they would have been on the hook for some of that money. Um, <clears throat> as it was, the pr the project greatly exceeded expectations, and uh, I believe this property was able to uh, they've, they've been able to, to pay down the debt much sooner than was originally anticipated. So that's been a real success uh, from from a public financing perspective. Uh, in a lot of instances, the uh, developer is not willing to assume that level of risk. In this case, in Englewood, uh, Colorado, uh, the city acted as the developer, and they had an ailing grade field, and um, they put up $25 million as part of a TIF strategy. Or actually, in that case, they, it was a quasi-TIF of sorts. And um, that's leveraged $160 million in private investment. They're netting 2 to $2.5 million in annual sales tax returns to help pay down that, that TIF. The alternative would have been to continue to let uh, the Grayfield uh, uh, decline. So some con concluding thoughts. I'll start out with some simple ones first. Um, Public-private partnerships often are necessary 
as I said, upfront costs are higher. Um, <clears throat> from the public sector, uh, if you're looking at attracting a town center, make sure you do your due diligence. You know, make sure you look at those retail factors that I, I just discussed. Um, if, uh, if you're looking at taking out a $25 million TIF to support a project that might catalyze $200 million of, of private investment, it might be worthwhile to pay for a $30,000 market study to, to make sure, uh, to, to make sure uh, the project is likely to succeed and to minimize your risk. And of course, design, design, design. It's so uh, overlooked. I see so many projects for which the design is mediocre and you think this project either isn't going to succeed or it's not going to succeed to the degree that it could. Um, <clears throat> and there are a number of main, uh, lessons for Main Street that can be drawn from town centers. So maybe you don't have a big uh, redevelopment site in your community that's ideal for uh, a big town center development, but maybe you have a burgeoning Main Street environment. There are a lot of lessons that you can take from the, the success of these town centers. And number one is you can confidently invest in public space. That's an, that's an anchor that will draw people in. Tenanting, know your markets and your limitations. Look at other Main Street environments and see what their, see what their sort of competitive position is. Um, maybe you want to do more of an arts district because uh, nearby Main Street is, is more of a uh, more of a high-end retail district. So position yourselves differently. Um, image, keep it clean and safe. That seems obvious, uh, but a lot of times it's hard to talk businesses into forming a business improvement district that's going to generate some funds to to help maintain their public realm. But it's absolutely essential in many instances. And think about what your anchors are. This is a this, this picture is a Main Street in uh, the Maplewood area of uh, Metro St. Louis, and uh, they have a big microbrewery uh, that produces Schlafly beer, and it's very popular, and that's a popular anchor. And by the way, I'm not uh, by any means predicting the end of big boxes uh, uh, as a result of the success of town centers, but it is a vastly superior model to conventional suburban shopping malls as well as commercial strips, given the mix of uses, public space, uh, the street grid that's often present. Um, but uh, big boxes are probably not going to go away. They're, they've got a, a good business model in the sense that it delivers a lot of low-cost products to people. And, uh, you know, hey, I'll be the first to admit I, I shop at Target as much as to anyone. Um, a, a few concluding thoughts about policy. Um, town center connectivity is only as good as its surrounding road network. Okay? So, you know, one of the criticisms of some town centers is that they're kind of fake. They're not connected well to the surrounding environment. Well, if your surrounding environment is, the, if this is your, your town center site and your surrounding environment is all cul-de-sacs, it's impossible to, to, to tie into that road network. Um, or it would be very expensive and certainly prohibitively expensive for a private developer. So in order to connect this site to some of these other properties, it would take public money. Whereas in this case, uh, with more of a connected street network, you can see it would be very easy to um, to tie a, uh, a town center into this uh, surrounding community. So um, this is what this is what our, our preference surveys are saying people want. They want this connectivity. So I think we need to think about uh, the types of communities we're developing, infrastructure priorities. Um, I picked Buffalo. Uh, not to pick on Buffalo, but they, they have had uh, almost no population growth, the region, from 1950 to 2000. And yet uh, the areas tripled, uh, Buffalo has tripled the area served by infrastructure. So it had no population, but tripled the area served by infrastructure. Now, you, you might be out there listening, and you might be in more of a high growth region, but it's very likely that your infrastructure growth has outpaced your population growth. And what that does for retail is it, it opens up all these sites, all these green fields for development. So we're constantly developing more retail and uh, letting the, the old generation of retail, uh, you know, kind of fall to the wayside. And it just, it keeps lease rates down really low. It's not that people spend a whole lot more. The region spends a whole lot more on retail because we have more retail centers. It's just that it spreads it out more. And as a result, we can't have as high quality of uh, development. 
town center locations. Some are better than others. So uh, this is the St. Louis region, which uh, for a metro region of 3 million people, uh, we have one of the few regions of its scale that really lacks uh, a town center development at this point. And I think we're going to get one, uh, and I think it's going to be incredibly successful. But some sites are better than others. Some sites are more sustainable than others. There are several sites, uh, I think, that are uh, available for development that are in a floodplain. And I think a town center would be pretty successful in those locations. If the Easton example uh, uh, bears out, uh, people will drive pretty far to be in a good town center. Having said that, there are locations closer to the outer belt. There are locations closer to the inner belt that are transit accessible, uh, that are closer to like the weighted population center of the region, and as a result, are more sustainable locations. Okay, and um, but it's going to take more coordination. Uh, the path of least resistance are the greenfield sites farther out. Uh, so I want to, I want to, I want you to focus your attention on this particular location. Uh, this is the area with the greatest income density in the Metro St. Louis area. In theory, it should be, have the highest quality retail development, and in fact, it does have one of the best performing regional shopping malls. But let's take a look at what the retail environment looks like here. Okay, this is the area I go shopping. Every I, I shop here every week, and I hate every minute of it. I dread, I'm dreading shopping here tomorrow, but I have to. You know, I have very little choice. And uh, what's interesting is the opportunity that was lost. And I'm not picking on anyone because um, this area that you're looking at in this image uh, falls under, I believe, three different uh, three different municipalities. And there were a bunch of different property owners who decided to develop, re redevelop their properties at different times. But what if in a perfect world we could have assembled all of this? Um, look, at, look at the opportunity here. Okay, we've got a Metrolink station, light rail station right here. We now have a, uh, a public uh, parking garage right here. We have these uses in blue that you see. These are office uses. These uses in red are retail uses that would locate in a, in a mixed-use town center environment uh, if the right opportunity were presented. Okay. Uh, these uses, not so much. These, this is Target. These big box uses generally don't locate there. And then we've got some, um, some pretty well-performing apartments. Well, what if we could have assembled all of these uses uh, around some public space? Imagine if you walked up out of the Metrolink station and, and you walked into a plaza in which uh, you could find employment, shopping, or maybe, uh, maybe you can live there. Maybe it's your residence and, and you take the train to work. Uh, to downtown or to Clayton or one of, one of the other employment centers that's accessible to transit. Wouldn't that have been great? And so my hope is that, you know, 10 or 20 years from now, when uh, we sort of reevaluate this site again, uh, maybe we can assemble things in a little better manner. And so in terms of policy, it's, you know, I think we have a choice. We can either continue to subsidize places like this. This is my, this is my target. Isn't it beautiful? I bet. Uh, I bet you all have never seen such a beautiful target. This received a lot of uh, a lot of public dollars, uh, TIF money, and so on. And it was it's 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 paying off it's paying off the um, the, the bond. But nevertheless, I, I think we have a choice. We can we can subsidize places like this, or we can only subsidize places like this, or places like these. We can um, you know we can put some other strings attached to the to the public dollars that we put in the projects. Uh, and require higher quality design, and require uh, places that are supportive of people. Um, and then uh, to talk a little more broadly, um, since this is put on by the Economic Development Division, I thought I might talk a little bit about uh, recruitment and retention of a talented workforce, and how uh, town centers uh, can can play a role in that. Because we know, I, I talked to you a little bit about preference surveys. We know that people, and particularly young people, and edu uh, young talented people, um, they they like public space. That's really important to them. And uh, interestingly, in terms of the correlation between education and economic growth, uh, the top ten metros have a higher annual rate of income growth than the bottom ten metros in terms of educational attainment. Um, <clears throat> So there's a real incentive to try to attract a highly educated workforce. And, and why the emphasis on young people in particular? Well, they, they move more frequently. So there's a better chance of attracting young folks. 
okay? But also, they're job creators, they're entrepreneurs. And um, what, are, what are these folks telling us? Uh, this is sort of young, college-educated folks, age 25 to 34. Uh, they're telling us that place is really important. And here's a study that was done uh, not too long ago that shows uh, the growth rate in close-in neighborhoods for this demographic is uh, greatly exceeding the growth rate of this demographic in most metropolitan areas. With just a few, uh, with a few exceptions, uh, where I live in St. Louis, this is pretty interesting, 87% uh, growth rate for close-in neighborhoods uh, amongst uh, the 25 to 34 year old demographic, uh, uh, people with four-year college degrees, okay? That's actually the highest of, of any of the communities surveyed. But to me, this isn't just about close-in neighborhoods. These, these are people saying we're moving to places with, um, with character, uh, with history perhaps, uh, with walkability, um, with mix of uses. Town centers can play a role in this, okay? So St. Louis, we've got a great stock of historic neighborhoods. Um, that's less the case in places like Las Vegas and, and Phoenix. Uh, so in, in, in those instances, you're going to have to look at ways to create uh, town centers and, and walkable environments if you want to attract these folks. Because I really think uh, there's, there's a, enough data to support that the communities that attract these folks are going to have more economic growth than those who do not. And let's see, my uh, slides are acting up on me a little. Okay, here we go. Uh, uh, three, more, three more slides. Um, at Development Strategies, we work a lot with um, market segmentation data. Okay, so we're looking beyond uh, basic age and income uh, demographic data. We're looking at uh, cultural preferences, buying preferences, preferences as to where people want to live. So this, you're looking at a map of um, urban professionals or a bunch of different sub-segments of urban professionals. And you can see within the St. Louis region, they all live sort of inside the, the inner beltway of 170. Uh, they tend to cluster around uh, some of the finest parks in the St. Louis area, as well as some of the safest neighborhoods, as well as downtown, and also some first-rearing suburbs that have um, really, you know, have uh, historic, walkable communities, uh, mix of uses. Uh, these are the areas that attract these folks, okay, overwhelmingly so. And so when we think about that, and I think about um, something that the Projects for Public Spaces has put together, this, this notion of the power of 10, the sort of challenge to metropolitan regions and communities to create 10 great places, each with 10 things, 10 different things in which to do. And I think that's a really great idea. That's a really great challenge to communities because I, I think you look, you look at the quality of these public spaces, and I think the communities that are, that that accomplish this are going to attract that young, talented workforce and are going to have more economic growth than those who uh, you know, do not invest in these public spaces. And I have some friends that are social planners. They're, they're, um, they're very concerned about equity and um, social equity. And I think this is really important because even if, if your greatest concern is providing uh, uh, better quality housing for the homeless, for example, one of the best ways to do that is to grow the economy. Um, so it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game where either we put um, um, money into public space or we put it into um, um, you know, uh, uses for the, 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 the most needy in our society. I think if we can grow the economy in, in communities, that creates uh, more wealth that can be, a portion of which can be taken to underwrite uh, all manner of, of social goods. So I think this power of 10 is a really, a, a really interesting concept that uh, communities should look into. Lastly, uh, my last slide, um, a couple of uh, concluding thoughts. The, 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 the takeaway I, I, I want you to have from this presentation is that, um, one, town centers validate a lot of planning and urban design principles, whether it's connectivity of streets, whether it's emphasizing um, development in more sustainable locations, whether it's basic urban design fundamentals, or the power of public space and the way that people uh, react to it. Um, we have essentially market validation that um, these, these fundamental principles that they work, okay? And so what's that mean for culture and policy? 
it's interesting. Culture and policy influence one another. It's, it's hard to change policy if, if, if the broader public isn't behind some sort of initiative. So my hope is that people will, will go to town centers and reconnect with public space and that they'll say to themselves, hey, we want, we want more of this. And I think what we need to do as planners is we need to draw uh, a direct connection between some of our policies, between the way we, inf we invest in infrastructure and the, the far reaches of our, 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 our metropolitan areas and how that, how that affects public spaces. And, and maybe more importantly, how that affects or creates an inability by the private sector to, on its own, deliver uh, high-quality public spaces to us. If we, if we think about policies and we think about how we're investing our, our limited infrastructure funds, maybe, maybe reallocate more of that to uh, cleaning brownfield sites in, in more dense areas and so on and so forth, I think we're going to see uh, the private market be catalyzed in, in a way that will lead to more meaningful public space development. So um, with that, I, that concludes my presentation. And uh, I'd be happy to answer questions or comments uh, for the remainder of the presentation. Thank you very much for that, Matt. Uh, we've received quite a few um, really good questions. Our first one um, comes from Sharon. Uh, she kind of addresses an issue on um, design versus uh, lifestyle choices or brand loyalties. Um, she, had, she discusses historic town and village centers in New England um, and how those places have context and authenticity. Um, a lot of the town centers that um, were described seemed somewhat homogeneous and um, there weren't very many obvious differences between some of them. Do you think that people are attached to the brand names such as Panera and Starbucks or are they looking for an experience that they can't get shopping online or driving through a fast food restaurant? Right. Okay, quite a few good points there. So I'll, I'll try to address them uh, one at a time. I, you know, I love I love small New England communities, and they are filled with history and character. Um, and um, and and a lot of pe what I love is that a lot of people uh, that live in in some of those New England communities they they recognize that value and they cherish it. And in many times, many instances, craft policies to preserve it. And uh, not all not all communities have been so fortunate. Some um, some don't have uh, don't have a lot of historic stock around which to build. Others have let some of the, some of their historic stock go, and and, um, and so that's necessitated uh, the uh, development of, of new town centers. And in terms of the in terms of the homogeneity or the the, the the architectural quality and character, a lot of that, if I want you to take one thing from this presentation, a lot of that goes right back to economics, okay? So the higher the higher the retail lease rates we can generate, the more uh, the more money a uh, developer often can put into um, into developing high quality architecture and high quality public spaces. So um, I think that often what, what I see with a lot of town centers in, in, in mid-tier markets, I'm really impressed with what they've been able to accomplish given the, um, given the economic constraints that they have, the limitations that they have in terms of the amount of money that can be put into public spaces. But by all means, we should make every effort to preserve some of the great high-quality spaces that we already have and look at policies that could uh, ultimately contribute to the development of, of, of uh, higher-quality uh, public space. Great. Um, the next question comes from Steve and addresses uh, amenities and alternative transportation. He asks, um, recent studies indicate that bicycle facilities in retail environments increase revenues by a large percentage. Can you address a little bit um, about these amenities and alternative transportation um, and how they impact the viability of town centers? Certainly, and uh, yeah, and I, I didn't mean to take a swipe at, at, at bicycle facilities at all. They they do create value. There have been a number of studies that truly really create uh, value for surrounding real estate, uh, particularly where they tie into uh, some sort of regional network. And uh, I've been really encouraged by a number of communities uh, that have made great efforts to uh, tie uh, um, 
bicycle facilities and alternative transportation means into their main streets, into their town centers. Uh, I think that's fantastic. The only, uh, the only time I would caution folks is when you have a finite amount of space and you have six feet of sidewalk to support your retail environment. Um, sometimes I think it would be worthwhile to consider devoting more space to uh, sidewalks than bicycle facilities as they go through your, your main street. Now, that's not to say you couldn't tie in that bike facility uh, indirectly or at some specific node uh, to your main street environment. But I absolutely think that uh, the, the efforts that uh, a lot of communities have, have, have made to tie their, their town centers, their main streets into uh, regional bicycle facility networks, pedestrian networks uh, will pay dividends. Um, our next question has been asked by a couple different viewers. Um, what is the appropriate mix between residential, retail, and possibly office to create a successful mixed-use development town center? And do you recommend more of a vertical mix or a horizontal mix? Retail office. Yeah, you know, that's interesting. It, it depends so much on... Uh, your individual market. That's one of the things I love about my job is that no two sites are the same, no two communities are the same. And so, um, you know, the, the, the mix that's going to be successful varies uh, from site to site. So we might be working on a project where there's um, a great amount of residential demand and a, and a modest amount of retail demand. In fact, we work in a lot of environments with that particular scenario. And so, you know, the question is how can we how can we best leverage what retail demand we have uh, in this community and, and how can we best integrate it with residential development um, in, in order to create uh, a successful and, and thriving uh, place and, 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 and that's supportive of surrounding public spaces. Um, so there is no, there is no uh, particular mix that can be broadly applied. It, it depends on on each and every site and each and every project, and and that's where um, that's where the fun of market analysis comes in, uh, because you get to look at those different factors and look at um, um, what types of uses uh, will be best supported in any particular project. Great. Um, our next question kind of addresses redevelopment and reuse of malls. Um, the viewer. Uh, provides a couple examples. Polaris Mall demolished one of its four anchor stores and redeveloped the site with an outdoor shopping space and um, public space. And then Hunter Valley Mall north of Baltimore constructed new shops in a parking lot near the light rail station. Have you considered the incremental changes that malls can do to improve their economics? Um, yeah, you know, this is something uh, we uh, it, in my office at Development Strategies, we, we kick around a lot because in a lot of instances you've got a community that has a shopping mall and they've invested a lot of money, already TIF money, and they're, they're invested in the project. And so um, you might be sitting here as a planner and, and going, well, that's, that's, you know, that's great that these town centers are doing so well, but you know, in my particular community our, our shopping mall is, is, is ailing and um, you know, we need to pay it down the bond for this TIF revenue, or for this uh, TIF. And um, uh, you know, the easiest thing is is redeveloping a project when a when a mall has failed. You know, then you've clearly got a great field project. But how can you retrofit a mall that's doing you know reasonably well? Uh, maybe they've got maybe they maybe they have you know sales of. Three hundred and fifty dollars a square foot, or something like that. What can be done to help invigorate that that mall? So maybe the answer is is creating uh, you know better public spaces. Uh, we've seen some hybrid lifestyle centers slash uh, regional shopping malls that have a little more emphasis on uh, public space. Um, maybe that's a helpful. Uh, maybe that can be a successful strategy. But it does seem like the 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 sea change that's occurring is going to disproportionately favor um, uh, open air uh, retail environments that are mixed in use. So uh, the, the, the long term trends may be against you. Um, having said that, I've seen a lot of uh, enclosed shopping malls that continue to thrive today 
uh, because they're in areas with great demographics. So that Tuttle Shopping Center in, in, in Columbus, uh, it's still doing reasonably well because it's got great demographics around it. So uh, the strategy is going to depend, uh, it's going to vary depending on the specifics of, of your particular site. And unfortunately, I'm not familiar with the Hunter Valley project, uh, but it sounds like if they have a transit stop, um, I think orienting some retail uses around that seems like a wise strategy. Great. Um, Heather asks, uh, have you seen or worked on any successful projects that had a surrounding lower income density and how can you entice developers to create town centers in lower income areas? Town centers in low income areas. Low income or low, low density? I believe she's addressing low income. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, that's interesting. Uh, we just we just put forth a uh, we did a, a regional housing strategy uh, for the St. Louis region. We we focused particularly on, on North St. Louis County, and uh, many many of those communities are ailing, and um, and um, we suggested a couple things. Um, First off, in, in that instance, the housing values are so low that it's become difficult for homeowners to invest in, say, a new roof or something like that because they don't feel like they'll, they'll be able to recuperate the, the, the money in, in the resale. So, you know, if you've got a $60,000 house, it's pretty hard to invest $20,000 in a new roof, for example. Um, and properties aren't appreciating at the rate they are in other places in the region. So, um, we proposed a, a, a multi tiered strategy. I don't want to go into too much detail, but uh, public investment in public space was was one component, um, as was uh, um, uh, providing more grassroots development by uh, community development corporations. Um, so by creating more meaningful public spaces uh, and looking at the demographic transition that's going to occur over the next 10 or 20 years, these areas might become more highly valued, especially if, if communities position themselves and invest in some in, in the quality of the place. Um, and what I'm suggesting isn't necessarily host, wholesale gentrification. Uh, in the case of North County, there are a lot of, uh, of middle-income earners who are, uh, unfortunately, in many cases, migrating outward to, to more outlying communities. So a town center strategy might be one to keep more of the, more of the, the higher tax-paying residents in your community to keep them actually in the community. So that's a way that public space might be addressed. Now, where do you get the money and the funds for that? Um, I, I, I cited a, 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 a case study um, <clears throat> of, a, of a great public-private partnership in, in uh, Cincinnati, over the Rhine area. Uh, 3CDC um, is, a, is a community development corporation and for which uh, a number of, of private entities, corporations, put a lot of money into it, and they then focused that money in a very targeted area over the Rhine, which admittedly had great architectural assets that were, were underutilized. But I think the idea of the corporate community getting involved, putting together a fund that, uh, for which they don't necessarily go do a bunch of super projects, but what they do is they fund a community development corporation that can then um, you know, have five years in the community where they're building uh, uh, confidence and trust and support and identifying uh, the projects that are going to be uh, most supportive of, uh, of, of positive development in the community. I think coming up with a financing mechanism, supporting those community development corporations, and then investing money in public space and, and place-based strategies, I think uh, could ultimately be successful for a lot of low-income communities. Um, Douglas asked a very interesting question. Um, is there any correlation between uh, successful town centers um, and weather, say places where it may um, have a mild climate or where it may rain frequently or have hot summers? Right. Um, um, open air shopping is done well in, in uh, South Florida, where, uh, where my wife is from. Um, it has done well in a place like Columbus, Ohio, where they get uh, winters. Um, I believe there's been some open air town center development in, in Minneapolis, which is uh, which obviously has pretty harsh winters. Uh, what's interesting 
is, uh, as you all know, like the, one of the peak shopping seasons is, is Christmas. And that's where retailers make a lot of their money in that, that time period. And there was this big question, like in the north, like how would, how would projects, uh, how would an open air town center do? Well, you know what? They end up bringing in, like they have like a, a big Christmas tree and they decorate it, they light it up, and they have Christmas events around it. And it's been a real activity generator uh, for, for a lot of communities. Um, you know, having said that, I think there are probably, you know, if you're in an environment for which it's raining 70%, uh, 80% of the time, maybe a town center strategy would be less successful, but I don't know, you go to a place like Seattle, it rains a lot, or, or, or Portland, and it rains a lot, but I still see a lot of people enjoying sidewalk cafes and these sorts of things, so, um, you know, I think that people will adjust to a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, climactic issues um, if there's meaningful public space. That may be different if it's, uh, you know, if it's 115 degrees in the desert. Very true. Um, Richard asked, should the private sector pay and provide for parking or the public sector, or is a public-private partnership um, on funding parking garages the most successful way? Okay, I'm going to sound like a broken record here because I'm going to say that it, it, it depends on the, the individual project and the market and so on and so forth. So, um, um, you know, depending on the market, uh, let's, say, let's say you're in, a, in an East Coast market where uh, retail lease rates are very high. Um, it, might be, um, it might be possible for a developer to self-finance uh, structured parking, underground parking, et cetera. Uh, with with no need for or minimal need for additional help from the the public sector, uh, there will be other uh, low rent markets for which a developer can't possibly make the numbers work and provide um, public uh, you know structured parking or something of that nature. And so uh, there, I think I think that communities have to ask themselves how important is it to us to have um, a well defined um, uh, town center. And if they decide that they want to have a town center, then um, the public sector is probably going to have to kick in some money. Ideally, uh, I think in a place like St. Louis, I think a town center would be somewhat profitable to the point that a uh, developer might be able to kick in some money uh, for structured parking or underground parking, and the pu public sector might have to pick out the rest of the tab. Um, I think that depending on the, s the circumstance, uh, that, that would be wise, especially when you um, consider what's at stake here and the opportunity of attracting a young, talented workforce. It might pay off uh, for the community, perhaps not directly, but indirectly in terms of broader economic impacts and the sort of ripple effect of, of having like a growing, uh, growing income base in your community. So I, th I think it's going to depend on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis and the strength of your community, but I will say if we quit over-retailing our environments, uh, private developers will be able to provide more, uh, more parking with less uh, public, public financing. Uh, David asked if you could cite any examples of town centers that have incorporated affordable housing. Um, Boy, good question. Um, I, you know, I would say, you know, I mean, the, the short answer is yes, and it just it depends a little bit on how we define uh, town center. So, if we're looking at like an Easton town center, a million and a half square feet, all the retailers are sort of national chains. Um, I, th I think there are probably some examples, but they're they're probably a little more limited. Um, if we're thinking of a town center as a Main Street environment, um, um, you know, with sort of a, a mix of local and national chains and this sort of thing, um, I've seen a number of cases where affordable housing is is uh, utilized uh, as a financing mechanism to uh, make the numbers work for for um, for particular buildings, maybe even a, a catalyst project. So uh, I have seen them. I think that uh, you're you're sort of Large, um, large-scale retailers might be a little less inclined to use, utilize that. But even then, you know, I've met a lot of developers that are are pretty open-minded if it's going to help their 
sort of financial strategy work. Um, what I have seen from national, like national developers, is more of a hesitance to have for sale development because they want to keep control of their of their site. Um, I think there's probably more of an openness to uh, probably a mix of some affordable housing by some of those developers. Maybe it's 20 percent, something like that. Um, but you're right. I mean, we're talking about value creation and um, and and catalyzing the private market and creating value premiums and sometimes uh, providing affordable housing uh, can be a challenge, but I don't think it's impossible. Um, and in fact, I think it's a, a good strategy, uh, as you mentioned, in, in sort of some lower income areas to help uh, create an environment in which property values begin to appreciate again and homeowners can confidently invest in their properties. I'm going to combine a couple questions here because they're related um, from John and Andrew. Are there examples of successful town centers that are not majority populated by national retail chains? And is it possible for town centers to support entrepreneurship? Right. OK. Um, I think that uh, you know, a, a, a couple of thoughts on that. Again, it, it kind of goes back to my last comment. It depends on how we define a town center. Certainly, there are a number of Main Street environments that have uh, perhaps brought in the national chain as an anchor and yet have a really healthy mix of you know, local, uh, local retailers. Uh, I've seen plenty of environments like that. Um, I think of the, uh, the short north in, in Columbus, which had a really burgeoning kind of grassroots uh, um, retail environment that started as sort of an artist community. Then they built this cap over the highway and brought in a few national chains. And I think they all sort of coexist together well. Um, um, I have also, I know at Easton Town Center, they've made an effort to bring in some, some, uh, some local restaurant tours. Uh, one of my favorite restaurants, the North Star Cafe, uh, they pulled them in as a tenant. So I think that, uh, I think some of the, uh, some of the even national mall developers are recognizing the appeal of having, having local businesses and local, uh, local retailers as part of their overall mix. So yes, it's absolutely possible. Um, I will say that uh, if you have a, a sort of a, a Main Street environment, uh, and like the one in which I live in the Del Mar Loop, uh, chains often pay a bit higher. They pay higher amounts of money for retail lease rates. Lease rates. Uh, more of that money gets put into the business districts, and or, or or as a result, there's more money for the business district. It's more money for uh, the sort of maintenance of of the of public spaces. So. Um, there can be an advantage to having a, a nice mix of, of, of local uh, retailers as well as uh, chains. Looks like we're getting close to our time, so I'm going to ask um, one more that talks a little bit more about um, implementation and the public's role. Can you talk a little bit more about how the city could act as a developer um, in a town center development? Okay. Um, let's take... Uh, Let's take the, the example in Englewood, Colorado, um, and you know th that may or may not be an ideal circumstance. Uh, a lot of developers have better access to uh, national, uh, well, to a host of national and, and even local retailers. But in their case, um, they uh, they did something interesting. They brought, I believe, their library and maybe their town hall uh, into into their town center development. And they were able to uh, get a mix of, of local and national chains. I, I won't say that that project's been a, a home run success uh, in terms of filling every every available uh, retail space, but it's also been a down economy, and a, and a lot of people haven't been successful at that 100%. But um, I think that that's I think that the the public's role or the opportunity for the public is to provide some of those other anchor uses or some of those other civic uses, and they can bring that into a retail concept, whether it's the library, the post office, et cetera. And that can make a place really feel a lot more authentic. So um, I think the public has, they, they have a role to play in town center development. Um, but I think there are some private developers that um, have uh, a little more experience at, at getting the, the right tenant mix and the right, um, the, um, the right design and so on and so forth. So uh, ideally you have kind of a mix of, of public and private. 
Very good. Well, Matt, um, on behalf of the APA Economic Development Division, we really appreciate you presenting today and um, for us to have the opportunity to sponsor this webinar. And we thank all the viewers for tuning in. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Brittany. All right. Thank you, Dustin and Matt, for the presentation. Um, so I'm going to switch over and I will just be going over a couple housekeeping items. So um, at, at this, uh, this will end the webinar. So uh, Matt and Dustin, you guys are free to go. And for the um, attendees who are still with us, I'm going to go over how to log your CM credits. Okay, well, um, to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to www.planning.org slash CM and select today's date, which is Friday, July 20th, and then select today's webcast, which is Town Centers, Their Conditions to Success, Economic Opportunity, and What They Say About Preferences Towards Inviting Walkable Places. And this webcast is available for one and a half CM credits. And you will also be able to find a recording of the webcast along with a PDF of the the presentation at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast-archive. So this does conclude today's session, and I want to thank everyone again for attending.